University of Pennsylvania, and I study learning and memory and consolidation in, in humans and in models. Um, and I'm interested in how the hippocampus encodes regularities in the environment. Um, and we use autoencoders as models of our hippocampus, and we have models that implement details of the of, of what we know about the physiology and the and the properties of the hippocampus um, in order to try to understand the function of different subregions and, and pathways and the different functions that the hippocampus does. Um, and then I'm interested in once you've encoded new regularities, how does information transform um, and become consolidated offline? And there's this idea that the hippocampus replays information to neocortex so that the neocortex can represent um, that information over longer periods of time. So we build models of replay um, and consolidation, and we're especially interested in sleep and the role of different sleep stages in that process. Exciting. Uh, Daniel, will you uh, say hello and welcome us? Hi, yes, um, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm at Stanford, where I work on a number of different topics at the intersection of neuroscience and artificial intelligence. Um, I've mostly done work in understanding uh, making models of the visual cortex, but I'm interested in a number of different um, brain systems. Um, and um, you know, have recently had a lot of experience with methods of unsupervised learning that are definitively not autoencoders. Um, and uh, would be happy to talk about that relationship between what we do and what we're seeing being really effective in autoencoders uh, um, or anything else people are interested in. Great, thank you. And now joining us also is Thomas Trebenberg. Um, will you uh, take 30 seconds and introduce yourself? Yes, glad to do. Um, hello, Thomas Trappenberg. So I'm a professor in computer science at uh, Dalhousie University in, on the east coast of Canada. Uh, I'm a physicist by training. I, uh, uh, I'm really working in computational neuroscience. Uh, also, the last uh, 10 years being at the computer science department, there are a lot of applications in deep learning. Uh, so we, we uh, concentrate a lot on that. Um, I have a real interest in understanding how we cope in an uncertain world and how uncertainty is really um, is reflected and uh, represented in the brain. I worked a lot on eye movements and uh, memory systems and plasticity, uh, but overall it is really understanding uh, how actually the brain is a deep network, but it's much more. Fantastic. And uh, joining us again for the second time, I think today, Srini, uh, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, thanks for having me again. Um, I'm a group leader at uh, uh, the Janelia Research Campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, uh, my lab works on building uh, computational models of neural circuits that um, where we've mapped out and measured the, the connectivity of the real biological neural system, um, uh, frequently in fruit flies, um, uh, for instance, in the visual system as well, um, just like Dan. Um, and so these are models that uh, we uh, um, we build, uh, you know, to model real biological systems, but using the tools of deep learning and and uh, um, variational autoencoders in some cases as well. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, we we've also been using deep learning for other problems like computational microscopy, designing, you know, programmable microscopes, and uh, um, and and more recently on uh, protein engineering for building, uh, um, for designing new protein sensors for imaging neural activity. Fantastic. And I think we may have one more person coming, but I'm not sure. Ah, yes. Uh, who is, um, I think not actually 5733 paper, I'm guessing. Demba? Will you introduce hey, yourself? Hey. Hey, Eric, thanks for having me. Um, so uh, you may recognize him from the outro lecture. Um, and, can you hear uh, me, Eric? We can hear you. Um, so uh, if uh, I'm Eric DeWitt, I'm one of the organizers of NMA and let's get to your questions because we have a shortened session today. Um, and there is a, a question that I was sort of thinking of starting with which we'll take very generally to begin with. It's from Nathan Young. He asks, uh, 
at what level of analysis do you think autoencoders are most useful? And I could think of a number of ways of interpreting that. So would somebody like to start out? Anna? All, all, all levels of analysis. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine you can imagine applying them in the way that I do in a way that's quite tied to uh, the details of what we know about um, the circuits of some area. Um, and, and that's really useful because we learn things about the, the properties of, of particular pathways that we're interested in. But um, I've also seen, and we also ourselves use autoencoders for much, much more abstract, broader questions. So I think they're a wonderful tool for, for finding structure and data that applies to all kinds of problems at all kinds of different levels of analysis. So I, yeah, I don't think, I don't think there's, a, there's a particular answer to that. Does any, anyone want to add anything? Maybe I can briefly chime in. Um, so autoencoders are fantastic, wonderful. We use a lot of variational autoencoders. So there are additional constraints which help us uh, to map a hidden representation, which has kind of some, some domain to it. Uh, I don't know if you went through there. So um, I'm quite interested. There are still, so, so the, the general principle of an autoencoder is fantastic and you can have really high level uh, questions asked with it. If we come to the real question, how do this, these representations which we learn compare to the brain, then, you know, we, we, I think there's a lot of more research uh, which we could do. Fantastic. All right. So um, I think because you just mentioned it, maybe we can tackle this question, uh, which is how can you think about using autoencoders for time series data? Um, and I guess that maybe Denba, do you want to give a, an answer? I'm gonna give a quick, uh, a quick answer and I'll let everybody else chime in. So I can see using them in a couple of settings. So you could think basically as a model of a time series as being a convolutional generative model, a sparse coding model. And um, if people got a chance to look at my lecture today, one of the things I've been working on is how do we actually use convolutional autoencoders as models of time series data for neuroscience experiments, let's say electrophysiology data. Another way I could see them being used, which has not, at least to my knowledge, been explored as much is in terms of uh, recurrent autoencoders and variational recurrent autoencoders, basically, as a model, as a generative model for time series. Hmm. I don't know. Anyone else? Tomas, do you want to add anything? Or Srini? Um, uh, so, so we've actually done both of these um, uh, for, our, for our work, where um, uh, in it's, you know, normally you think of a VAE as sort of a black box generative model, and then you're, you're kind of using an encoder to help train the decoder, which is really your generative model. And frequently these are black box neural networks that are um, maybe generating images or neural activity. Um, uh, in our case, what we're trying to do is to train models of either, you know, a biophysical system, like let's say you have, uh, um, uh, calcium imaging data and you have action potentials generating the calcium activity, um, we use the neural network to do the deconvolution in a probabilistic manner. And so you have a generative model that's given to you by the biophysics of what's happening inside a neuron. Um, and, and, you know, that's fairly not black box at all. It's interpretable. I mean, we know exactly what components go in there. And then you can train your, uh, your encoder to basically invert um, this uh, probabilistic model. And uh, in, in another world, um, what we do is we, we have, uh, you know, um, biological neural network um, uh, implementation uh, of, uh, you know, the entire nervous system for a C. elegans one. Um, and it's crawling around. It's a recurrent neural network um, with, uh, you know, all the, you know, bells and whistles that you expect to have in a biophysical network model. Um, and uh, if you have measured neural activity using calcium imaging, say, then you can again use the framework of a VAE um, and you have the neural network, your model of the nervous system be the generative model. Um, and that's an RNN. Um, and then uh, you have the encoder um, help you sort of do inference there so that you can train up this model. Um, so this is a, a special case where, you know, um, the generative model is well-known, well-specified, and we're using it as a tool, the VAE, to do inference. 
Fascinating. I think that, um, you know, one of the things is that maybe people think of autoencoders uh, as a pretty restricted class, but, you know, what you're saying is actually we can think of them and anytime you're connecting this sort of uh, inference and, and generative model, you, you can think of it as an autoencoder. Um, I mean, I guess one of the things, obviously, um, and we'll get to this in, in a second, like there's deep connections, we think maybe between having a, an, an inference model and something like the visual system, but we also, when we use visual imagery or remember things, we're probably doing something that's using that, also, that same kind of mechanism as, an, as a generative model to reconstruct something. Um, and I guess I've always thought that, you know, that I can think of this as, as an autoencoder in some sense. Um, but before we get to that, there's a question here for Demba, I think, about whether you could actually go and implement an autoencoder in real time and thinking about spike sorting to doing online uh, spike sorting. Um, do you think that's uh, feasible? Is it just a question of computational power or? I personally think it's feasible. So the evidence that I have for this is an online experiment we've conducted. I think it just takes having very powerful GPUs and essentially having some familiarity, which leads to an interesting point that I would have loved to make during this Q&A session. So there's an interplay between the architecture and basically the hardware that you're using to do the inference, right? So I think using that combination with uh, the algorithms that are designed to actually solve the sorting problem, I, I don't think it would be unreasonable to accept, to expect real time, depending on what you mean by real time. So to compute a vision people, real time means <laughs> something else. Thanks. Um, so I guess one of the things we need to think about is um, what the underlying uh, representations are, our latent representations. And there's a question about how we think about the number and type of hidden units and the way we're training our autoencoders. There's some, I guess, um, uh, trade-off between having sort of the optimal number of hidden units for some task and still having interpretability. So I guess greater reconstruction, uh, more hidden units, but then it becomes harder. We can also imply cost functions like the variational uh, framework to do something that might make those more interpretable. Maybe there are other ways of thinking about this question. Um, Daniel, do you wanna speak to that? Uh, to the question of uh, the trade-off between number of units and interpretability? Yeah. Uh, I'm probably not the right person, actually, to talk about that. Um, maybe I would, maybe somebody else, Srini or somebody else, or, or Demba, or, or Anna, or whoever, I would be better. I'm happy to make a comment, but I'll, I'll let somebody else go. I got nothing. My world right. is very interpretable already. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I mean, I've, I've, I've got a quick comment here. Yeah, I've got yeah, a quick so comment. Demba, go ahead. Eric, Eric, okay, okay. So what? I, so one of the things that I tried to stress in my outro presentation is actually relating to a point that was made earlier. So at least my philosophy at this point is that if you start with a probabilistic generative model, so just the decoder part, it turns out that there's an encoder that is in one-to-one -one mapping with that decoder. Well, that decoder. So sorry, that encoder has in it the number of hidden units that would correspond to your model. So, so my own feeling is that starting with a probabilistic generative model, it could automatically put some constraints into your autoencoder and actually tell you what the number of hidden units should be there and what the weight should be and so on and so forth. Hmm. Well, does no one else want to add something I can, to that? I can make one more comment that I think yeah. speaks to some of the other questions that are bubbling up here about human memory systems. So, oh, yeah, well, I was uh, going to go to that next, actually. That okay, was exactly them. what I wanted to do. So yeah. if you want to go there, let's do it. So I think because yeah. th this is related. Um, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, well, I mean, OK, so maybe I'll, I'll just sort of I'll get to that point, but I'll take this question of our human memory system similar to autoencoders. Um, so first, I just want to make the point that I think the entire brain is a is a memory system. So I, hmm. I sort of, you know, it depends what you mean by memory systems. But but assuming that you mean kind of like episodic memory, um, which is often what people are thinking about when they say memory, um, then you there are some very special properties of the hippocampus, not just in humans and um, in lots of animals. Um, it's a very preserved structure um, that make it um, special and in some ways more interpretable. So. Um, although interpretability doesn't tend to bother me so much um, for our applications, but um, we have, and this also gets to this other question that somebody asked about human, the number of trials, like if you're trying to model a human 
experiment. How many trials are there? So if we're trying to model a human episodic memory experiment, we need to be able to have a system that can encode something in one with one experience. And we take that very seriously. So when we build models, it has to be able to do that. It, we use the same number of trials that we use in our actual experiments. So how is that possible? Um, the part of the hippocampal system is extremely sparse, has an extremely high learning rate, and it's extremely sparse. So it takes inputs that might be highly correlated and orthogonalizes them. Um, and if you orthogonalize things in that way, you can have a very high learning rate um, and, and not suffer for, from the typical interference kinds of issues that you get with a high learning rate. Um, so if you do things that way, then you end up with things that look like play cells, you know, things that really like, they're really quite localist in their coding. So that you can find a cell that seems to kind of just code for this one location and not that much else. Um, and so that's true in these networks if you have really high sparsity. So that, that answers a bunch of questions. Interpretability, um, the, the, the uh, speed of learning, you can learn quickly, but it, it involves being in a regime of high sparsity. Um, and uh, and um, what else did I want to say? I had one other point. Anyway, I, 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 yeah, you get it. No, well, I think, I think, I think that was good. Um, so I guess. Can I, can I, yeah, can I add please. to this or, or a little bit yeah. uh, a tease too? Um, you're right. This is one really a memory system, which is highly, you know, uh, looking up associatively, uh, you know, relations. But there are all the other type of memories. And when it comes to more generalizability, then, of course, all the things which you have uh, mentioned, uh, especially the sparseness will and the uh, orthogonality will be a hindrance. So it is still fascinating for me to think about how really the interactions then, especially also with the, uh, you know, different type of memories then work. Yeah. Um, so, so not all is, of course, hippocampal memories. Also, that's no, a, no. a fascinating part that of it. Yeah, we think that that orthogonality kind of um, property is is extremely rare. It's extremely rare. There's very specialized circuitry in the hippocampus that implement that, and you don't see it really anywhere else in the brain. And we don't even think the entire hippocampus has that property. So we think it's very important that you're you're doing lots of distributed representation learning um, for most of the things that you care to learn about, to the extent that you're trying to represent structure structured information. Um, but for this particular function, where you're trying to remember things just you saw one time without interference, that's that's a very sp special thing. And that and for that function, it seems like it's useful to do this thing you wouldn't otherwise want to do. OK, that I think I want to ask Daniel to comment on what he mentioned earlier, which is sort of the, the, the work he's been doing and how it relates to uh, auto encoders. And I guess I made this claim that, you know, we might think of um, the visual system as potentially acting in some ways like a folded auto encoder. Um, and, and maybe, maybe you don't think that that's a good analogy. So I just wanted to know what you thought of and what it is. Well, I, I think it's a very plausible idea, a very natural idea. Um, the problem, well, let me put it this way. What makes an autoencoder non-trivial is the nature of the bottleneck that it has. And I think the history of autoencoders over the decades has been finding better and stronger bottlenecks that you use to describe the sort of, sort of dually to your generative model. The nature of your generative model is the thing that is used to construct the autoencoder bottleneck. And so um, what I think has been true in the visual, in like the primate visual system is that it's been very, very difficult to find a strong generic bottleneck such that with just the autoencoder loss alone and that bottleneck on, you know, acting on natural images, what arises is actually a good description of the visual system or good at high level visual tasks. That actually just hasn't panned out. I, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's quite natural concept, but like it's turned out to be very difficult to build good visual representations with that concept. So, you know, like, so far as I can tell, there's only two possible ways in the vision system. Now I'm just talking about this sort of computer vision problem of, of like 
handling RGB or input arrays of natural images. There's really only two like methods that have like basically arisen for how to do unsupervised learning. Okay, one of them is autoencoding losses, and the other are distributional losses. So things that don't act on individual points, but instead act on like how the distribution of the data should be. And there is a a recent development, well, by recent last few years, of very powerful unsupervised learning methods in this sort of domain of contrastive embeddings. And those contrastive embeddings um, really are not autoencoders. They instead um, like act by describing what you want as properties of the distribution of embeddings of inputs. And you can describe kind of generic heuristics about what those distributional properties should be, even if you don't know anything about the particular uh, representation of any given point. And by virtue of how they're constructed, these, these um, you know, distributional loss functions or objectives are highly non-trivial, right? There, there's not like a triviality problem that you have to find a bottleneck to, to like, or a generative model to uh, avoid, <laughs> right? And so you don't have to figure out how to construct a generative model of the world um, to start with, to have a good bottleneck to make, to, to like a, prevent the autoencoder from, from basically finding a trivial representation. And so in practice, it's turned out that these distributional or constrict, cons, you know, contrastive distributional objectives are actually way more powerful or easy to use to produce visual representations that like solve high level visual tasks and have intermediate layers that like look like neural, neural you know, that whose whose activations look like neural responses throughout the visual system. Yeah, so that was what so, I wanted you know, to- like, I, I, I mean, This is not to say that autoencoders are not good for all of the reasons that everybody else has said. They're great pieces for data analysis and- So can I, can I just ways. ask you to speculate then, Dan? I think, uh, um, here, here, here's a question. Like, imagine that we, we have a generative rendering model for, um, for visual scenes. Um, and, 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 you know, you can think of all the um, work that you've done and, and others that um, basically render 3D scenes. If we then take that generative model and now train um, an, a, an inference network, a recognition, an encoder, uh, to couple with that, to do inference, um, to figure out what were the latent variables that generated that scene. Do you think that would be a good model of the visual system? I think it would be a great idea in a way for trying that's... to build a model. Yeah, I just think that it's really hard to, it's like, it, there's like a, the precondition for that to work is that you have a good generative model of the world. And that's yeah. incredibly yeah. super challenging, right? right. And so like, um, let me put it this way. I think that at some point it may be such that figuring out how to find things that are sort of generic enough to be learnable and like you don't actually have to sort of know all, like a, producing the generative model of the visual world so that it will be good as a bottleneck is a great strategy, but very hard to execute. And so like, um, and this is specific to this visual domain. Like I'm sure there are brain domains where it really makes sense to think about things as an autoencoder. Like I should not be interpreted as saying the opposite of that. Okay. It's just that in this sort of like dealing with a visual system, like it's incredibly difficult to describe the generative model. And so, you know, it may very well be that actually um, like other constraints are better ways of thinking about how to actually produce good visual representations. Um, but I don't disagree with you. If you could really do what you just said, I think it could have a lot I mean, of legs. Yeah. In, in, in the sense that, you know, we think of the world as the generative model, the, the decoder, and our visual system is the, is the encoder that's trying to infer the state of the world, you know, what, what but what's, the, but what's the bottleneck of the, of the, of the autoencoder here? Ah, uh, that's the latent representation that generates you know, the, but what's the, the world. What's, like if you just think of the oh, world. I don't know. Itself I, as the I, data. I, I don't that's know. I'm waving hands part. here. No, yeah. wait, wait, wait. So, so I, I wanted to, to come back a little, let's try to cast this slightly more generally because I, I wanted to ask why, I mean, the brain is a relative to the scale of the world, even the manifold of our sensory inputs, uh, a system that's um, 
you know, it's got to do a lot. It's got to reduce things if it's going to act and behave. It's going to deal with the, the sheer combinatorics of all possible sensory experience. So it seems like there's some kind of potential bottleneck between the world outside and our inference about, you know, where we are and what we need to well, do. But what is it? Well, I, I, admittedly, I don't know. But let's say, you know, the stuff that Anna's been talking about with, say, representations in the hippocampus and, and the ways we actually, I'm thinking, you know, the way we think about uh, value learning, something that I think about, is often trying to figure out how to assign a state to the world that's low dimensional. And if you have sort of a prior that you want to have the simplest model as possible, because actually one of the things that's really hard to do is learn what to do in a complex changing world where you don't have strong priors and you have to build things up, you're going to have to add state. So you're, you, you may have simply a prior on a simpler model as a good starting point, which builds a bottleneck in. And I mean, I don't know that, that we sounds, have a solution. That sounds for reasonable, this, and but, I, I like nothing. If there's nothing unreasonable about what you're saying, but um, you know, in practice, I think it's been very hard to act on in the context of making like visual system models. So, so that let was me, the, that, let me, let me just ask you. Let me, yeah, because when you say that, I'm curious. Do you mean specifically seeing representations inside the network that reflect the activity in you know v1, v2, v3, v4, or is it something else? That or having the output of the network be good at solving high level cognitive visual tasks. So like cate image categorization, uh, any of those metrics, right? So let me, let me describe a result, which is if you take a ConsNet as an encoder and some various forms of decoder and you just use the bottleneck, if you use just dimensionality reduction as the bottleneck, meaning that the, that the you know, the intermediate, the latent layer is low dimensional compared to the input. The network that's produced that way will end up being um, very far, very bad compared to say, supervised networks at solving tasks that macaques do. And the neural responses throughout that network do not resemble neural responses in V2, V4, IT. They kind of do in V1, right? To some extent, but the, above that, they they diverge tremendously. And so, stacked autoencoders have actually not produced a really good, uh, in an, any obvious way, approach to making deep network models of that like do you know vision tasks or look like neural responses in intermediate or higher visual areas. So Dan, uh, one of one of so, one of the things we've been thinking a lot about, not to cut you off, but what do you what do you think about sparsity as a bottleneck? So not just having a lower dimensional representation, but potentially having a higher dimensional representation, but that in response to different inputs would be a sparse representation. Uh, I think that it's, you know, I think it's a great idea in practice. I think it hasn't solved that problem at all. So the, like the way I see the history of it was that like unsparse autoencoders don't do a lot. Sparse autoencoders, sparsity in addition to dimension reduction is a somewhat better bottleneck and have early layers that, you know, or if you do it with a single layer network or a couple layers, you get stuff that looks a bit like V1. So it is a good idea in that regard. But if going beyond that, like multi-layer stacked sparse autoencoders um, don't have the property that those intermediate layers look like neural responses throughout the visual system or that the, like, the latent representation is actually good at solving many high level cognitive tasks. So like, it's a great idea, but I think there's been a long history now of trying to figure out like, so <laughs> frankly, I think the idea doesn't work. Not that it's a bad idea. It would have made, it certainly made sense to try. It's just that sparsity is just very far from strong enough of a constraint, right? And, and so like, um, you know what? I, I don't doubt that there is some form of constraint like bottleneck loss function, you know, like VAEs are a form, right, of course, of, 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 of regularization on the bottleneck, a, a complexity penalty. I mean, all autoencoders are basically, if you have a hourglass in, you've got a complexity penalty in the middle, and then you've got a decoder out, right? So VAEs are a good form of that, and they're really good for lots of things. But just, I mean, just even in vision alone, they, just for the vision case alone of, of, of category, like of, of, of deep necks with like standard visual real world input, it's just not strong enough. Well, or it's I think not clear exactly what the what the make the distribution types and how many variables and so forth. So you know, um, like, 
I think I think we we, we yeah. understand that. Yeah, yeah, I think we understand what your concern is. I, I mean, I think there are two sort of simple ways to think about this. So it's it's an open question in the sense that just because it hasn't been demonstrated yet doesn't mean that it won't be. And that's great because we have a lot of students in the audience that hopefully will be looking forward to a long career and trying to solve these kinds of problems. I think, uh, Thomas, you wanted to say something a little while back, and I was curious if you had a last thought for us. Well, I... Oh, I forgot what it was probably. So, so interesting discussions. Um, I have to say, I'm, uh, I haven't followed the lecture. So, uh, you know, at the end, we still, you know, the autoencoders are great, but of course, in, you know, at, at the end, we have a transformation from the visual system to action to the action space. And uh, so, uh, and, and, you know, we have, so we have deep networks in the encoder phase, in the decoder phase, we have recurrencies in it. Um, so there, I think there, it's, it's fascinating what you're talking about, um, but really to, I'm looking forward to, to really understand in the context of the brain, how we can, what, what is there additionally, what we don't do just in applications, for example, of, of autoencoders. So it's, 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 it's wonderful that when I heard about this, this, this workshop and really thinking about it, um, I uh, went the last years really studying uh, you know, deep networks um, more as a theory. And then I'm just so fascinated and, and going back now to the brain and just see where is really the difference? Where, what, what, what can't we really explain uh, with these simpler models? And there's still a lot of modules, a modularization. So we are thinking of a system level uh, organization. And uh, so there's, there's still for the students, lots, lots of really interesting things to do. Yeah, um, and I think we have to close, unfortunately, because this is an interesting conversation and probably there's a lot more to discuss, but there is one last question that I feel obligated to ask. Um, and, and that's for you, Srini, and, and it's by uh, Fernando Lehu, and it's got 25 votes. What are you drinking? <laughs> um. It's a um, Sam Adams uh, summer ale. And the funny thing is somebody had already decoded that in the chat because I saw it go <laughs> by. So um, with that, I wanna thank uh, all of the panelists who joined us. I'm sorry, this was a short session today. Um, at least it's clear that there are a lot of open questions. And I, I liked the way um, Thomas was speaking about how we can try to think about the comparison between something in deep networks, be it autoencoders or convolutional networks or general adversarial networks or anything else. It's not that it necessarily is a model of the brain, but it may tell us in both its similarities and its differences, things that we should be looking for or thinking about. And the kind of conversation we've been having with Daniel says, you know, here's a space where something that seems like it actually may represent and, and well describe things in the hippocampus, maybe it doesn't in the visual system, maybe it doesn't both if we apply a different set of cost functions or we come up with a new way of thinking about the problem. Uh, or it may be that we need to move to something else, but that's great. That's, uh, that's what we're here to do. So um, thank you all. Uh, and this is the last question and answer session for Neuromatch Academy 2020. It's been a long fun ride and I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I hope we've answered at least a few of your questions and I hope that you will stay with us. You have Neurostars, you can continue to ask questions there. Um, and you have each other. Uh, and now I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, thank you. Goodbye. And uh, we'll talk everyone. to you all soon. Bye.